Welcome back to the show that tells you, you are a quantum computer with free will running off of a distributed network of microtubules. My name is Justin Riddle, and this is episode 13 of the Quantum Consciousness series. Today, I'll be introducing you to the microtubule and giving you the sales pitch on why microtubules are the best candidate for a universal quantum computer in biology, enabling single cellular and multicellular life. This episode is available on YouTube, and an audio-only version is available on Apple Podcasts. If you like what you hear today, then please like the video, subscribe to this channel, leave a comment below, or for the audio listener, write a review. Join me the mystery of numbers. Come and hop a metaphysical all righty so in the previous episodes we've been talking a lot about what is a quantum computer how does it build off of the technology of digital computers and what is knowledge what is information how do we form ideas what is mathematics And a lot of this has been dealing with sort of this philosophical side of why we would need quantum mechanics and why we should look to quantum mechanics as a novel solution to these fundamental philosophical questions that we have about, you know, the nature of life. And today I'm really going to dive into the, the instantiation of a quantum computer within biology. How do we get a quantum computer in our cells, in our brains, in our bodies, if we are a quantum computer, where would that be, right? It's uh, it's fun and games to talk about, you know, maybe a quantum computer model of cognition or or discussing us as quantum computers. But, you know, I really want to focus on how does that work? Where would we find this realistically? And so I'll be talking a lot today about the Roger Penrose and Stuart Hameroff model of where we would see quantum computers in biology, and their pitch is that it is the microtubule. And I'll give you some background on what is the microtubule, why is it an ideal candidate, you know, what are some other options out there, and what is sort of the mainstream opinion, and how does this sort of differ from that that mainstream opinion. And then in the next week, I'll be diving into the objective reduction, the more quantum mechanical side of how the quantum computer would would really function in a uh, realistic sense, going through time, processing information, and sort of diving more into that mechanism at the really fundamental um, chemical and protein scale. But today I'm really going to make the pitch about microtubules. So when you hear people talk about you know, we need to create human cognition and we're going to make it out of neurons, right? And so there's these, these computational models called neural networks. And in, in a neural network, you have a bunch of different nodes and they all have connections to each other. And the model here is that each node is like a neuron and it activates, it has this electrical potential and it transmits signals to the next neuron. And so you create a grid, a network of all these neurons and people are trying to build models of how these connections between neurons and the activity within this uh, network of neurons that are all firing or not firing, how this would give rise to complex human behavior, right? And so you have a lot of scientists working very hard modeling all of these neural activity patterns of signaling between them all. All right, what is a glaring problem in this model, right? So if you're trying to say that this is your model for consciousness and for complex behavior, Well, what is going on in single celled organisms? And I think this is a, you know, really straightforward, uh, I guess, missing plot hole in the neural network model of consciousness. But Stuart Hameroff makes this really great argument um, against pushing back against these neural network models of consciousness. All right, you're trying to model perception and behavior. Well, we know that single celled organisms existed roughly 4.5 billion years ago and they've been evolving and the world was composed entirely 
or this planet was composed entirely of single-celled life until just 500 million years ago when there was a Cambrian explosion and multicellular life came onto the scene. But there's this billions and billions of years gap where you have only single cell life. And single cells can perform a lot of the complex behavior that we consider to be life or, you know, that we're trying to model with these neural networks. So single cell life can have sex, can seek out food. You have predator prey relationships between some cells hunting and consuming and eating other single celled organisms. I mean, there is this entire ecosystem of life at the single celled level. And just because we can't see it, we're not really aware of it, but there is so much complex behavior going on. There is a you know, birth and, and lifespan of a single cell, and it goes through a lot of the same fundamental processes that we consider to be, you know, human or, or related to, to multi-celled organisms. And we see them at the single cell level, right? Hunting for food, um, smelling, sensing the environment, moving towards food, running away from predators. So the question is, if you are a neural network modeler and you're trying to give a model of how complex behavior comes about, well, how do you explain a single-celled organism, right? If you're trying to explain perception or behavior and action, then you need to have this happening at the single-celled level as well. I mean, so even if your model is somehow true at this neural network level, Okay, well, how does that explain single cell life, which already has all of the properties of what you're trying to solve for at the neural network level? I think this is a glaring oversight in the neural network modeling domain, not to say those models aren't valid, but just saying that, you know, if we rely too much on this, like, neurons fire and then they're done modeling, um we're kind of missing the bar, you know, evolutionarily looking through our history and our past and trying to explain all of life and all of um, complex behavior that can arise. Um, oh yeah, one more example is that single-celled organisms can learn from their environment. So there's, there's these uh, examples where you can suck a single-celled organism up into a tube and then you let it escape and then the, you know, the suction is on and it'll avoid that uh, suction or it'll learn how to exit the tube more quickly. So there's sort of a capacity to learn and you know maybe that's not the equivalent of like a memory but there is a form of learning going on at the single cell levels. So yeah I challenge you to think critically what is life? What is uniquely human or mammal and what do you find even at the single cell level and then how do we then go and explain this amazingly complex displays of behavior at that single cell level. All right, what is the answer? Well, one answer is microtubules. And so when you think back to your junior high biology class when you were learning about the cell, there was something called the microtubules or the cytoskeleton that they introduced to you and they really introduce it to you as the scaffolding of the cell, right? It's kind of just a architectural component of the cell, and that's pretty much how it's sold to you. And then the nucleus with the DNA is like the core of the, of the cell, and this is like viewed as like the brain of the cell is the nucleus containing the DNA. And the DNA is this sequence, this code, this algorithm is maybe built into that sequencing within the DNA. And that is potentially where the, you know, the important aspect of life comes in. Or this is like the key to unlocking behavior and complex perceptions and, and things like that. Um, however, if we go look at what a cell does, what is this cell doing on a practical level? So if you look at a cell, and here's, here's some common examples that you'll be um, aware of or that you will have heard of. So one example is 
uh, the sperm. So the sperm has a tail and that tail is responsible for moving and sort of swimming that cell around. And that tail is composed entirely of microtubules. All right, we have mitosis where you have um, a cell that's being divided. And so you have the DNA and it gets lined up in the center and then it gets pulled um, in half, right? And the chromosomes get split. And these little tendrils come in and they pull the DNA and the chromosomes apart and then they recombine them. What are those little tendrils? Those are microtubules doing this very complex act of pulling apart this, this DNA. And if you look at any cell, it's going to have these little hairs around it and they really um, make the cell swim, right? If you look internally into the cell, we have this naive idea that in the cell, it's kind of like this bag of minestrone soup, right? There's a bunch of little carrots and tomato chunks and a little bit of this, a little bit of that, some spice here and there. Uh, but it's mostly liquid and it's just like this big bag of stuff and if you were to shake it, all the things would move around. Well, in reality, the cell is jam-packed with stuff. What is it jam-packed with? It is jam-packed with microtubules. There are tubes everywhere inside the cell. If you were to peel back the phospholipid bilayer membrane and look into the cell, it would just be this really complex network of tubes everywhere the eye can see, tubes, 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 right? And the space between individual proteins is like countable numbers of water molecules, right? Like proteins crammed in there, these microtubules crammed in there, and it's really just this like dense jungle of proteins um, inside the cell. And of course, these organelles, um, which are also in there. So the microtubules are everywhere. They are involved in moving the cell around through the cilia. It's kind of like swimming through the environment. And it is forming this network all around the cell. So what we really need to ask the question is you've been sold this narrative that DNA is really the fundamental um, code of how the cell is gonna work. But in reality, we look into the cell and there's this massive network of tubes growing and shrinking, moving the cell around everywhere. And in addition, these, these networks of tubes are even conveying proteins around the cell. So as proteins are created, they get transported along the microtubules, kind of like a, um, a traffic system or some like uh, highway of, of moving these proteins around. So if we look at cellular activity, DNA is helping you encode, you know, what proteins to create, but a lot of modern DNA theory or people that, are, that discuss DNA, there's a lot about how you use DNA. DNA is a recipe book on how to build proteins, and it probably does a number of other things that we don't quite understand. Um, there's a lot of junk DNA or dark DNA, meaning it's like mysterious and we don't really know what it's really doing. Um, but that DNA needs to get used. It gets read in. It gets, um, you're kind of taking that recipe book and you're building a protein according to the recipe, right? But it's really about genetic expression. So you have demands contextual demands, and then you need to get more proteins because the cell needs more of that protein, right? There's a context. And then in that context, the DNA is activated in some way, and it's read in to, to generate um, the proteins that you need. But here's the question. Where is the brain of the cell? What is making decisions in the cell? Is it option A, a diffusion process, right? Diffusion is sort of the simple classical answer here. There is a local demand and then, you know, we, we sense some noxious stimuli, right? Some poison is in the environment off to the, uh, the side of the cell over yonder. 
and now the cell needs to withdraw from that location. And so that sets off a bunch of local cascades of activity. And then those cascades, you know, kind of propagate through the cell and they diffuse into the cell. So then option A is really saying that there's a bunch of these protein cascades and these protein cascades are sort of the primary network within the cell. But then the question then becomes, you know, how do you have sort of coordinated behavior, right? So if I have a noxious stimuli over here, I have a predator over here, I have a food source over there, and another food source over here, who makes the decision, right? I have two threats and two um, rewards. I need to choose which one to go towards. You know, if it was all local activity, it'd be like, ah, constrict on these sides and expand on those sides. And you'd have cells like kind of growing and shrinking towards a bunch of stimuli at the same time. And so what does it choose? Which wins out? Maybe there's like a protein cascade that that is sort of uh, takes over eventually and sort of wins that that debate. Um, but it, it is a fundamental question here. Option B, what's the alternative to this chaotic diffusion protein cascade model? Option B is that there is a universal centralized command system built into every cell at its core and it creates a distributed network where you can integrate information across the cell into a single hub, make a single decision, go for that food, run away from that predator. When you witness individual single cells, you see rest and digest mode, casually seeking some food, taking a rest, and then you see fight or flight. There's a predator, there's a poison, I need to run, I need to get out of here. You see the same pattern of overarching behavioral states dominating these single cell life forms is there a centralized command hub that is doing all of this at one time, right? And the cytoskeleton is that candidate. And so the alternative to diffusion-based protein cascades is a centralized computer hub that is universal and forms a single unit and that makes a single functional unit come out of this very complex, multifaceted, spatially distributed system. Okay, so historically, how did this come about? What makes a microtubule strange compared to the common thoughts about a protein? And how might this serve as a quantum computer? So here's some of the things that make a microtubule weird, or here's the primary thing, right? When you think about a protein, we have this common perception that, okay, I'm a little protein here, I have some inputs, some outputs, and I perform a certain function, right? It's, it's kind of like an appliance or like a microwave, a refrigerator. A protein has a sort of given function of what it does. It can take in this input, transform it, do this thing, do that thing. They kind of have a finite set of operations that they can perform. And so every protein is kind of like a little tool and a lot of biology is, you know, understanding how this protein makes this chemical transformation happen and this other protein has a different chemical reaction happening over here and then they interact and this one is sensitive to this input, generates this output. And so there's these networks of like, this protein does this and then that activates this protein, but then this other protein comes in and regulates that interaction and each protein has a certain function and you go and you look at the structure of the protein and through that structure, you know, what it can bind to, what it can do, you understand the function. Through the structure, you get the function and then we have this um, sort of di these diagrams of all these protein interactions and these cascades where one protein activates another set of proteins, activates another set of proteins. And there's these pathways of proteins and regulatory feedback channels and all this jazz, right? What's weird about the microtubule? Okay, the microtubule is a single protein, it's called a tubulin protein, 
and it's repeated in a helix pattern. So I believe it's around about 13 around in a circle and then it keeps going. Kind of has like this candy cane like spiral to it where they're all connected in this nice uh, topology and they form a tube, right? And so there's a tube, there's single proteins here and every protein is the same, right? So then when you see the microtubule growing and shrinking, moving over here, grabbing this, pulling that apart, moving the cell forward, this locomotion. How do you get all this complex behavior from a single protein? There's nothing else going on here. It forms a tube, which is a little weird. It's like this geometric pattern, this tube pattern. And there's a single protein spiraling through the, the, these tubes. And there's this full cytoskeleton, this network of tubes linked up with these little proteins that link them together. But it's fundamentally and mind-bogglingly simple in that it's a single protein. And I think that this really messes with the standard biology approach, right? From the structure, we get the function. Okay, well, what is the structure here and how would that lead to a function? The structure is a tube made out of a single protein. Where is the function there? And how does complex behavior and activity come out of this? This is a fundamental mystery. And Stuart Hameroff, who is a biologist um, by training, he came into this uh, back in the day, I think it was the 80s, and was viewing these microtubules as universal digital computers. There's something very bit-like in these microtubules. It appears like there's a bunch of bits and these microtubules are just made up of like a bunch of, uh, you can think about like a bunch of transistors, right? You want like a bunch of transistors, you wanna store as much information, zeros and ones as you can. And so maybe, just maybe, these microtubules are some form of digital computation device. And if they are blank, meaning they don't, you know, it's just the same thing repeated, then maybe it's programmable. Maybe you add a little protein here, add another protein here, you add some connections onto the microtubule, and now you're programming this sort of like universal Turing machine, perhaps, and it's serving as sort of a universal digital computer that can be programmed, can execute algorithms, and can handle a diversity of inputs and generate a diversity of outputs based on some algorithmic process. So the initial idea was that these microtubules can serve as universal digital computers, solving the kind of mystery of why is there just one protein over and over and over and over. Well, it's because it's a programmable computer and you want function to be flexible. You want flexibility, you want it to be programmable, so you don't want an inherent function built into the structure. You want it to have that dynamic element to it where it can be coded into this or this or that or that, right? And then, moving historically to the next stage in the story, Stuart Hameroff had this microtubule model of digital computation, and Roger Penrose is simultaneously discussing the limitations of digital computers and thinking there has to be a quantum computer in our biology, but where in the world am I gonna find a, a thing in biology that's ready to be a quantum computer, right? You wanna find something that can be a universal quantum computer that has sort of a mysterious unknown functionality in biology, performs core, 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 core behaviors at the center of a cell, acting as sort of an executive unit, and Stuart Hameroff and Penrose met. I believe Stuart Hameroff read Roger Penrose's book, Emperor's New Mind, sent him an email and said, hey, I think I have your biological structure. You wanna put a quantum computer into a cell. 
I have this bizarre microtubule network that needs you know something more to explain its function. And I now realize from reading your book, the limitations of digital computation through Girdle's incompleteness theorem and see the previous episodes. Um, but could we maybe investigate a quantum computer model of microtubules? And thus the, the magical collaboration of our past was born and they worked tirelessly and developed this model over many, many, many years talking about how a quantum computer could be fit into this microtubule system. So what does this mean? What does it buy you to have a quantum computer in a cell, right? What it buys you is it buys you a central single executive unit inside of a cell that acts as a command center which can make decisions for the future of the cell. And then that decision is propagated across the network of microtubules, right? So I was talking about, we get a reward stimuli, we have a predator, we have some poison, we have some food, and we have a possible mate. And I'm a single celled organism. I have two rewards, different types, two um, attack vectors, uh, different types. How do I integrate all this information and what am I gonna do right now? I need to make a decision in this moment of what to do. Well, I could count on these protein cascades uh, in that option A that I talked about, the digital or kind of local reality version. But what if it takes a while for this diffusion process, right? A cell is giant, not to us, but to a protein. Everything is about scale. The cell is enormous compared to the size of a protein. To move a protein across the cell is the equivalent, I mean, I don't actually know the exact scale, you know, number wise, but it is massive, right? It would be the, you know, roughly the equivalent of like moving, running across town uh, to move a protein from one side of the cell to the other side of the cell, right? So how do signals get transmitted across the cell in an effective time? You know, if I'm a cell and I'm the size of a small town, I would have people running across the town trying to talk to each other and then, and then there's like the mayor's office trying to, you know, adjudicate what to do next. I mean, this is like a state of chaos. You have all these messengers running around, someone trying to make decisions for the cell, um, and then trying to carry out those decisions. I mean, that would be a complex web of slow moving pieces to make something happen. Option B, you got a quantum computer in the microtubules. All you gotta do get your input into a tube, right? <laughs> so there's like a noxious stimuli, sends a protein cascade, get that signal into the microtubule, and then you go into a superposition across a bunch of these microtubules. More on that in the next episode. That superposition state that is maintained within the microtubules creates a very fast transfer of information. Some people say it's the speed of sound is the, the rate that a signal transmits within a quantum superposition. Other people theorize that it's even quicker, near instantaneous, um, faster than the speed of light. It's kind of like wrapped up into this, um, this system that is, that is delocalized fundamentally. And so you don't necessarily even need to transmit the signal because it is a delocalized entity. Anyways, point being, whichever of those interpretations is, is more accurate, signals are able to transmit at a time frame that makes it biologically feasible to have a single cell integrate all this information from all around the cell, make a single decision, wave function collapses, that output is transmitted simultaneously, near instantaneously, across the entire microtubule network. Boom, everyone knows what they're doing. Every part of the cell gets the signal of go. We're gonna wait on this. We're gonna activate towards that thing. Now the cell has a single executive unit moving towards some goal, right? This is a non-trivial solution to a very difficult biological problem. Okay, so that's option, or that's uh, explanation one of why it's important to, to have a quantum computer on board, uh, the speed. 
Second is exponential search. So we talked about this in the quantum computer episode, but quantum computers potentially allow you to search exponentially large spaces in polynomial or linear time frames. So this means that when you're coding a digital computer, you want to search all possible options. I could do this or that, and I could do this or that, and I could do this or that, and I could do this or that. That explodes that sort of splitting off of possible options. It explodes exponentially into this very large space of possible solutions, and it takes a very long time for computers to search these spaces, right? But those problems arise very readily, very simply, very easily. And so much of digital computation and software engineering is designing little hacks and heuristics and shortcuts so you don't need to search these exponential spaces because your computer will not get the answer in any reasonable time. We're talking about computers running until the end of, of the universe just to figure out you know, which restaurant to go to based on 30 different criteria. Um, it explodes that quickly. And so imagine a biological system how many options do you have there? If you get a bunch of inputs coming in, you could have exponentially super large systems or, or problems evolving and you need to get to an answer in a reasonable time frame because you're about to get eaten. So you need to get an answer to what you're gonna do. And if you're searching these exponentially large spaces and you're a digital computer, you're running out of time very, very quickly. However, if you're a quantum computer, you're able potentially to search these exponentially large spaces quickly, get an answer, go, right? Another cool aspect of quantum computation and biology is that digital computers need to be programmed and the programming is finicky in that if a zero and a one is flipped, you might have a catastrophic failure in the algorithm. However, quantum computers have a very natural evolution of open up a search space, you hit a threshold, it collapses, you get an answer. It might not be the best answer, but hey, at least it's a answer, right? In digital computers, you're not guaranteed to have any answer. So if there is sort of any sort of chaos in the system or some destruction of part of the computer, you can have catastrophic failure where, you know, it just never computes anything. So I think the quantum computer has a more readily available way of having a naturally occurring computation, quantum computation, where you don't need a programmer per se, right? Which is actually a really hard problem when you try to imagine a digital computational system in a cell, in a, in a body, because you know, what happens when the algorithm fails? Who wrote the code? Can you really write computer code through a chaotic, random process, like a lot of evolutionary theories sort of pitch? Um, so I, I think there's a lot of, of other benefits to, to thinking of, of a quantum computer in a cell, just in terms of like feasibility of getting this off the ground in an evolving system without programmers. All right, finally, couple comments on why you would want this from a consciousness perspective, right? And we'll get into this more um, in the next couple episodes, but neurons have stable microtubules, right? And so in most cells and in single cell life, microtubules grow and shrink over time. However, in neurons, they're stable and they're uniquely stable. It's a cell that has uniquely stable microtubules. And the microtubules stay stable throughout your entire lifetime. Neurons are the one cell in your body, maybe there's a couple more, but they definitely stay stable throughout your lifetime. The neurons you're born with when you're a baby are still there when you're an adult, aside from the ones that get pruned and get destroyed over time. There is some neurogenesis for sure, but overall, the neurons in your brain stay stable throughout your lifetime and the microtubules stay stable throughout your lifetime. So this is a really cool opportunity to say, you know, if you had a quantum computer in your brain, 
The association of consciousness with neurons and with brain activity fits well with microtubules because those microtubules are stable. And so the quantum computer held within neurons in particular might have unique properties of stability throughout the lifetime, which bodes well for a theory of consciousness because we have a narrative experience of our lives. I feel like I'm the same person as when I was a kid. Where is that stability? How is it created? And so the microtubules fit along with neurons in having that lifelong stability. Um, next up, and this is a similar argument to the quantum computer argument of, of consciousness, is that you can create a sense of self, right? So one of the properties of quantum systems and of quantum computers is that they have a single wave function. There is one wave function governing the quantum system and so this could be the equivalent of a sense of self, of being a single person. And so the challenge in the neural you know, system of microtubules is you got to bridge across cells. We need to create a stable, you know, macroscopic microtubule system that goes across a bunch of neurons and is able to sustain these very large quantum computers, these very large superpositions. And then we're getting closer to being able to say, oh yeah, that distributed network of microtubules undergoing superposition, that superposition is me. My consciousness is embodied within this large distributed microtubule network and it occupies, you know, there's debates on this. Maybe it's a bunch of pyramidal neurons and prefrontal cortex that are housing your consciousness. Maybe it's a much wider network. Maybe it's slightly dynamic um, and there's pockets of, of subconsciousness within you. More on this to come in the future. But the microtubule model is sort of a neural plausible model of creating a single self and the feeling of being a self out of this messy, wet, noisy biology that we have. So I'm gonna leave it on that. And next week we'll be going into objective reduction. How do we create sustainable wave functions and superpositions in this chaotic, wet, noisy environment of the brain, of the cell, of the protein, of the chemical level? So we'll be going into that and talking with more detail about, about that in the next episode.